everyone. Uh, my, na my name is Hamza Arsbi from Jordan, and I run the Mind Lab. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you all about how I lost faith in uh, charity. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I do want to start to walk this statement back a bit by kind of distinguishing what I mean by uh, charity. Um, there are some organizations, like the ones we got introduced to today, uh, such as Ruwad and uh, the Said Foundation, who have very uh, defined focus areas, and they work uh, sustainably in, their, uh, in those areas, and those really leave a lot of um, uh, impact. The charity I'm referring to is the overall system that we currently have to deal with that has to do with international organizations giving out grants um, in exchange of specific uh, uh, measurement figures and um, uh, CSRs that uh, businesses uh, dispense. Um, my story basically starts with, so I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, I hope this way I kind of cleared the room, uh, you know, uh, I'm a science scholar, I, uh, I want to maintain this kind of connection, so. <laughs> um, so my journey started in 2012. I was a second year student at the University of Jordan. Uh, you know, uh, change was in the air. We ha everybody was excited about the Arab Spring, and uh, uh, you know, Jordan was pretending they're doing some reforms. And, you know, like we were all excited. Um, at the time, I got frustrated with the fact that uh, the education system that I went through did not prepare me or my friends to engage with the academic uh, life and rigor of university or with the practical life of you know, entering the uh, job market. This is when I decided to start my own organization. It was a full nonprofit, uh, and its main goal was to teach uh, science. It was Before it was called the Mind Lab, it was called actually the Scientific Culture Society. And my vision was, if I work hard, if I push myself, if I do what I have to do, um, then I can change Jordan, I can turn it into a knowledge-based economy, I can increase uh, people's interest in science, and we can move to be a better, uh, more prosperous uh, community. That did not happen. <laughs> um, we, we worked for five years on uh, projects across the, uh, the country. Uh, we operated in almost every city in Jordan. We reached over 8,000 students and were, um, from the ages of five all the way to 16 and uh, developed our own content. We had uh, funders from uh, you know, USAID to, U uh, to UN agencies and many others. Um, for our work, I got a lot of awards. My CV was very happy, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I was filling up on people applauding my work and, uh, you know, I was even called the Jordanian success story. Um, uh, I, you know, I went on many events where I talked about the impact and the things we were doing, but there was a bit of a problem. I, when I would sit on my own, I would feel the emptiness. That is, you know, there was a discrepancy between why I started my work, which is my real desire to create change, and where I'm finding myself. I found myself a part of a system that was basically reinforcing uh, the problem that I'm, I'm already trying to fight. So, uh, people, my work was being used to kind of prop up the system that's already there, and everybody would, uh, every time someone wanted to take a picture with a young person with a, an organization, they would call me up, um, and I would be glad to do it because, you know, recognition, impact, that's wh what we started to define it as. Um, grants uh, that had, uh, uh, very specific KPIs demanded of us to uh, deliver, uh, you know, basically just good numbers and good pictures. So all our work turned into selfie events. We would go in, we would, you know, have a good time with the kids, everybody would enjoy themselves, and then we would leave. And, you know, they would go back to their own lives, and nothing would change. This is, you know, this one was one of the biggest issues I faced. The other issue I really struggled with was our sustainability. 
I felt we were not sustainable on both sides. Um, we were not sustainable financially, so uh, every time a grant would be delayed, every time the government changed their rules on funding and I had to wait another couple of months, I had to lay people off. Uh, you know, we had a very minimal skeleton staff and it was, it, it was painful. Um, and at the same time, I didn't feel we were sustainable enough to uh, build a relationship with the people where we work with. So, uh, the students, we, we didn't have enough time to really instill what we wanted to work on. This is when I decided to make a change. Um, so, I took out my first loan ever. That was like around two years ago. Uh, I took out a small loan and opened my own center. That's when we switched to the Mind Lab because we started introducing new programs. We added robotics and engineering and um, also some concepts of uh, social entrepreneurship for kids. Um, our center started to catering to private schools and organizations that can pay. And this income and revenue generated started funding our nonprofit work in the governorates. So we allotted each uh, member of our st uh, staff uh, a specific hours that they have to spend non-profit. So part of their work is the non-profit work. And they were getting paid through the, this for-profit uh, center. Um, at the core, uh, you know, we adopted the design thinking model. I'm not sure if everybody, everybody is familiar with it, so I'm going to go over it uh, really quickly. Um, Design thinking is one model of human-centered design. There are many, and this is not in any way perfect. Um, we just adopted it because I believed in its first message, which was empathy. Um, I believe that if we teach kids and adults, you know, empathy, uh, we can really uh, move our system towards a more human-centered design where we realize our impact on people. Um, this process goes through, you begin with empathy, you define your problem, then you start coming up with solutions. So you do not immediately jump to solutions. And this is a big uh, thing that's counterintuitive to many organizations operating now. We go into a community, we decide what the solution they want, and we do it for them. And we call them beneficiaries. They're not, you know, I, I like today that many people actually call their beneficiaries partners, and that's, you know, that's the right attitude to take. Uh, but, you know, design thinking reminds us of this, and it uh, goes to show that, you know, you can have an intuitive system that people can follow. And we adopted it and started training people on it because it's easier to show creativity in a, like a step-by-step -step kind of uh, uh, format. Um, Basically, then we started developing our own model of it. So this is the Mind Lab design thinking model for kids. Uh, we added two extra steps to it and tried to make it more simplified in, in Arabic. Um, the first step we added before empathy was, um, you know, who am I? So introspection. Um, this is because we found that many people, uh, you know, we're working with kids, but even adults do not take the time to think about themselves and their own identity. What, what are their own values and what forms their personality? And so for them, it's hard to empathize because they confuse themselves with the other person. So they think they're empathizing, but they're not really. And this is why, you know, um, we added this aspect where think about yourself, draw the borders, and then stop, step over that border. And this is what we try to achieve with this. Of course, after they go through empathy and, you know, uh, identifying the problems and then, you know, ideating solutions and prototyping and testing, we wanted to say, okay, so we need to make it happen. So we called it, uh, the official term for it that we use at the center is actualization. And it's, we didn't use the word implementation because we split it into two uh, subgroups. So actualization works in terms of implementing, so creating an action plan, uh, handing out responsibilities and all that. But at the same time, it's also presentation, how to uh, get people in, how to pitch it to other people and really expand on your idea. Um, so basically, you know, wh what we're trying to do here is shift the equation. I do not think that CSR for companies is genuine enough. Um, 
I don't think that the attitudes currently um, you know, adopted by uh, uh, big organizations who sometimes have amazing staff who really want change are uh, you know, sufficient enough for the current uh, system to really solve our problems. We're not currently equipped to solve these problems and we need these kind of programs to educate the younger generation and hopefully even you know, uh, get it into our businesses and our organizations as well. To move over from CSR, from considering yourself you know, community, uh, responsible to your community, to actually part of the community. To stop thinking about, oh, uh, let's do, you know, our community responsibility is to sponsor uh, a small football league for kids or uh, do a small event or a blood drive, but actually think, when I create a new service or product, how does that impact my community and my environment? So have empathy and understanding at the core of the business. So I want to end this with, you know, my call to action. And that one is, I ask you all to work with me to move all businesses to become social enterprises. To have collective action as the core uh, of uh, our culture and our uh, way forward to solving our problems. Thank you. Thank you, Hamza. Next up, please help me welcome Samaya Mansour, education researcher and consultant. Tear gas, rubber bullets, ambulance sirens, and I'm gasping for air. Al Shab Yurid Isqat al Nizam. The people want to topple the regime. And an unfaltering chant I hear from a distance, and it keeps playing in my mind over and over and over again. This is how I remember the summer of 2015 back in Beirut, and this is what, uh, this is what our reality has come to be since October 17. What's currently happening in Lebanon follows a series of revolutions uh, and upheavals and uprisings across several Arab states in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and we find millions of young people taking uh, the streets to protest against sectarian regimes, authoritarian regimes, uh, different forms of injustices, and to demand their basic rights, uh, to demand more participatory ways uh, of living and, and being together. But since uh, 2011, very little has been changing. And uh, while I might sound like a naive uh, reductionist to many of you, I argue for my capacity as an educator and education researcher um, that the failure of the Arab Spring from fulfilling most of its promises is not only a failure of democratic ideals, it's also a failure of education and the way young people learn about and participate in civic life. See, I work at the intersection of education, a democracy, positive social change and citizenship. So I look at all the formal and informal spaces young people have to learn about who they are, to learn about their role in the world, and I focus on strengthening the democratic quality of these spaces to empower young people to become agents of positive change in their communities. Um, and probably most of you are wondering what education has to do um, with all of this. Um, education is a very powerful tool that can be used towards positive social change um, because it socializes young people uh, into um, societies based on society's uh, values, norms and ways of uh, uh, living basically. And it has the power to enable them to develop voice, agency and perspective. And it has the potential to also prepare them to become um, uh, agents of change by providing them with the concepts, the tools, and the skills they need to actively participate in shaping their lives and influencing um, their immediate realities. Um, and what I found from my work in the Arab region, uh, generally and in Lebanon specifically, um, that our education systems have been failing young people for a really long time. The education system has failed me and it failed my, many others. Um, this is because uh, despite the improvements in access, quality remains really poor. 
Um, and we find that even the curricula that are still being used in state education uh, system, they're outdated, they're very rigid, and they just expect young people to be passive recipients. Um, and also, teachers are very poorly trained, um, so they do not actually have the capacities to uh, create learning uh, environments that foster critical thinking, uh, uh, problem solving, creativity, and independent thought in general. And in some parts of the world, uh, education systems are being used as tools to promote loyalty and compliance to existing uh, political regimes, and that's really scary. Um, and that happens either through uh, formal uh, civics education programs or uh, through the uh, values that are being perpetuated um, uh, in school uh, cultures. Um, and, and wh wherever we find citizenship education programs in the Arab region, uh, sadly, they tend to be uh, very uh, theoretical and content uh, focused. So young people are just expected to memorize facts and information that are, that are very much disconnected from notions of citizenship and society and what's needed there. Um, so they don't have actual opportunities for um, dialogue, uh, uh, actual civic engagement, um, and uh, real and meaningful action that would uh, help better and improve um, our societies. And since the Arab Spring, we saw a rise in um, lots of uh, development uh, projects that are funded by external agencies and they're implemented by um, uh, local NGOs. Uh, and you might say that's actually really helpful. If the public education system is not doing its work, then we have civil society and other actors that are uh, trying to fill in the gaps. Um, but what we found is um, these programs tend to be uh, kind of there to, with the purpose of democratizing or civilizing uh, Arab nations. So they come with this neoliberal approach and understanding. And, and what happens there is actually um, they, they hollow out what it means to be a citizen, an Arab citizen. They hollow out um, a culture and identity. So they tend to be very ineffective in, uh, in that sense. And we also found that young people um, exist in, in, in traditional um, hierarchical and authoritarian uh, social systems. So they've been, they've been enduring uh, 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 like a long time of uh, silencing and oppression. Um, and the assumptions we have of young people are very limiting. So we tend to think of them as either too naive um, or, or too uh, irresponsible, unreliable, and they cannot thus participate in shaping our reality. Uh, and another extreme would be thinking, them, uh, thinking of them as a, as a risk um, or a danger, so they have to be left out or, uh, or controlled. Um, and that's really the, the, the challenges that we have been facing and the spaces uh, that we see uh, young people actually uh, uh, have. Um, uh, and, and when we come to think about uh, uh, all of this, and we come to think about what it really means, what, what, are, what messages are we telling young people when in the, all these spaces? Um, and what are they learning about who they are and the role in the world? Um, the social institutions and the existing spaces in the Arab region, um, they tend to function as deferred democracies. So they're kind of uh, positioning young people as citizens to be, uh, not citizens in the now. And that's really um, um, dangerous because you're denying their uh, voice. You're, you're, you're denying them um, opportunities to exercise their agency. And learning to be a citizen is not about transmission and acquisition of skills. It's about participating in your everyday lives and, and the democratic conditions that are available for you to kind of develop uh, this understanding of who you are and what you can do and what you can contribute um, uh, to your society. Um, and, uh, uh, and most of these social institutions, actually, they are uh, uh, developing submissive uh, citizens. Um, and uh, while this might be a very uh, dark picture, I have hope, because and many speakers spoke about the youth bulge. Uh, this is actually a good thing. If our uh, uh, region has a youth bulge, so uh, uh, it's disproportionately youthful, we can use it as an opportunity. Uh, and honestly, to tell you the truth, we've seen from all these uprisings and revolutions, young people shocked us with what they've been able to successfully do. They challenged traditional uh, systems, political, established political systems. They organized themselves. They worked on several advocacy groups. And, and uh, we also saw a rise of grassroots 
grassroots movements there. And even the cultural and artistic expressions uh, through graffiti, political chants, um, and all of that. So if we transform the ways we educate and work with young people and we re reposition them as partners and parts of the, uh, the solution, there is a lot of hope there that we can move forward and that they can actually uh, contribute uh, to the development of, of the region. Um, uh, uh, but learning within a democracy or, or for, uh, or the democracy to come as this the case in uh, uh, some Arab countries, um, it's really important for us to understand what democracy means and to rethink democracy as not only a state of governance. And here uh, uh, I borrow uh, uh, an understanding of democracy by one of my favorite educational philosophers, John Dewey. So John Dewey says it, uh, democracy is a way of living and being together. And with this understanding of democracy, education becomes more of a, a moral endeavor, a moral project, and a practice of freedom and liberation to develop committed citizens, engaged citizens, citizens who uh, uh, have the understanding and the belief that what they do makes a difference, that they can participate in, uh, in change. Um, and definitely uh, citizens who are committed to social justice, uh, uh, democracy, uh, and uh, uh, their, their communities and the betterment of, uh, of their communities. So the real question for education and education system is uh, actually, how can education systems be transformed uh, in ways that promote agency, power, perspective? And how can we together work with young people to help them imagine and create alternative futures that are sustainable, democratic, and uh, that are peaceful? Um, and, and, and uh, while I attempt to answer um, uh, the question uh, based on the work that I've been doing, um, I think what really matters for us is to change what we teach, how we teach, and where we teach. And uh, when, I, when I talk about where we teach, it's the conditions of learning. So the culture, the structure of the education system and the schooling, uh, uh, and specifically democracy and education would look like power sharing, um, creating opportunities for real action and engagement uh, uh, and promoting intergenerational partnerships within schools, creating positive school environments based on trust, equal value, uh, freedom, and, and uh, transforming our curricula in ways that would make them uh, more hands-on, project-based, and related to uh, uh, young people's everyday lives. So really what is required is a multi-stakeholder uh, approach to education reform and change where we're working with the community, with parents, with teachers, with administrators, education researchers at universities, and students as part partners uh, and, and uh, having them have a say uh, in, in their education as well. Um, and you might wonder if this is uh, at all uh, possible. It is possible and I have hope that this is possible. And I think it is time uh, for hope uh, for our region. Thank you. actually, of doctors, medical students, and healthcare providers. They started four years ago in the aim of supporting medical research, healthcare, and education in Syria. In order for us to implement, or better say, um, make a reality of this aim and this purpose, we started to work on three main aspects. The first one is Research Resource Center. We know that in a country like Syria, a developing country, 
we are realizing that we lack the resources for research in Syria. So how did we manage? How are we, uh, how are we thinking to overcome this obstacle? Through Research Resource Center. We are working at Research Resource Center to provide an educational research content for young researchers, aspiring researchers, and medical students through, our, through our many articles that we provide on our website that help those students start their journey in medical research. Another aspect that we work on is the projects that we do. First is workshops, practical workshops that help students and medical doctors and starting uh, their journey in medical research in, in acquiring the main principles of research, main skills in research through our workshops. And also trying to implement these workshops in research projects on the ground in Syria. Uh, last but not least, our th uh, third aspect that we work on is our blog, simply, to share our ideas, to share inspiration, and to share expertise. So, how are we working on uh, building a research capacity in Syria? Well, our mission is, for start, uh, Our mission is uh, using an approach, an evidence-based approach. Is it working? Sorry. Uh, okay, that's better. <laughs> okay. Um, our mission is working on, on a number of healthcare fronts in Syria in order to improve the healthcare system in Syria. So, how do we envision doing that? Well, simple as. Uh, working or using an evidence-based approach in doing that. How uh, do we plan to do that? Well, uh, it's something that, let me say, I, I believe that kind of the distinctive thing that we at MED are uh, uh, doing. It is connecting international research expertise with resources that are on the ground in Syria. How or why? Well, simple as, uh, in Syria, we have resources, we have access to data, but uh, unfortunately, we lack expertise or we lack uh, guidance and mentorship. So through doing this, connecting those people and connecting to the two parties, we are hoping in, uh, for, in this uh, manner to make, a, uh, I don't know how to say, a movement in uh, rebuilding the healthcare system in Syria. How are we doing that? Who's supporting us and who's with us? Who's helping us to do so? Um, many parties have come to help, such as, to say, uh, Clinton Global Initiative. We share a common goal of uh, press, uh, addressing pressing issues and what could be more pressing than uh, the situation that Syria has been going through in the past few years. Um, so, uh, working together with Clinton Global Initiative and Clinton Global Initiative University in order to address such a problem. Uh, we're also working with Boston University, a school of public health. Uh, we're working together on providing a course on epidemiology for uh, Arab-speaking students that are aspiring in research. But our main collaboration and our recent collaboration is with Cancer Research Center of Tishreen University at the city of Latakia in Syria. Together with Cancer Research Center, we're working on creating the first cancer biobank in Syria. So you could imagine the huge amount of work that is needed that the, the team is working on. So, in doing so, are we, uh, did we face any obstacles? Yes, we did. How did we manage to overcome these obstacles? Well, let me tell you a little bit of uh, success stories and uh, maybe share some, some of these obstacles with you and maybe share ideas on how we could overcome these obstacles. Um, one of the obstacles that we faced when we worked on antimicrobial resistance project in Syria, we worked on, collab uh, on collecting data from eight uh, different hospitals in eight different cities in Syria. You could imagine, because of the current situation in Syria, we had a lot of difficulties in um, accessing this, the, the data. 
and we had a lot of difficulties in uh, organizing these data as we didn't have any unified ways of archiving these data. We managed through a lot of work and through um, gathering forces together in order to uh, overcome this obstacle. Uh, the antimicrobial resistance project is now submitted to the bulletin of the World, World Health Organization and it's now a success story of our team. Another success story that I'm going to tell you about is the study of uh, visceral and cutaneous leishmaniasis in Syria and the effects of uh, the Syrian crisis on the uh, prevalence of leishmaniasis in a Syrian city of Latakia. Well, because of the Syrian city and the uh, outbreaks that happened because of uh, what's, uh, the conflict and stuff like that, um, in Syria, we noticed that there was an um, outbreak of leishmaniasis and that's um, say because of many reasons. Uh, how did we uh, manage to study the effects of the crisis on this such outbreak? Well, we teamed up with, uh, uh, with centers of uh, infectious diseases in, um, in the Syrian city of Latakia and we managed to get their, the data and we managed to make a research project that was published in a journal, a peer-reviewed journal. How, what kind of obstacles did we face? Well, first of all, we had to get, um, uh, let me say, we had, we had to get the data to be, uh, um, uh, you know, to keep secre uh, secrecy, patient secrecy. So we faced a lot of problem, problems in order to maintain this secrecy. But we managed in collaboration with the center uh, to overcome this obstacle and that became another success story of ours. Well, are we still facing any difficulties? I'll let you take a guess on that. Yes, we are. Um, first of all, at Med Research Team, we work utterly and entirely voluntarily. No funds available. So all the work that we managed to make so far is done in our, how, how, the, how do I say it, in uh, blood and sweat only. No funds, no any other thing. So, so far, that's one of the obstacles that's preventing us from expanding our work in Syria. Um, other stuff that's preventing us and other obstacles, well, the lack of, as I told you, uh, expertise. We need expertise that would help us and guide and mentor our team and other aspiring researchers in their research journey. Um, how could we manage to overcome these obstacles? Well, an, an idea that I said earlier, it is connecting international expertise with the research resources on the ground and the research, um, uh, the people who are working on the research here in Syria. This, in, in this way, we would make a, say common interest, uh, research, international researchers would contribute to the research project here in Syria and our team would gain much expertise and much work and provided and done. This is my team working together in workshops and in social uh, events. So, this inspirational team has managed through all these obstacles and through all these troubles that has been on the way, managed to make a lot of things. First of all, we managed to, uh, to provide more than seven research workshops. In addition to our online uh, courses and articles on research, we managed to benefit more than 1,000 students, more, one, more one than 1,000 medical students in Syria. Uh, we managed to publish more than seven publications in uh, peer-reviewed journals and we are also still working on other five ongoing projects in Syria. So, despite of all of these difficulties and obstacles that hit us on the road, our team, Med Research Team, is continuing to prove that the youth and the young generation is the key to improve healthcare and to improve the region to take part in improving what is being asked in this uh, era of time in, uh, in the country or in the region, to say. But to be honest, 
this young generation needs support. So imagine what this young generation can do when given the right and sufficient support. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm told that I'm allowed 15 minutes, so I have an extra four. I'm going to use them freely <laughs> if anyone has any questions. Hi, thanks so much for your, uh, for, your, for your talk, it was so interesting. The most impressive thing for me is that you're still so active inside the country at a time when it's so difficult to get anything done. As someone who goes in to Syria often, every, every couple of weeks, I know how uh, dysfunctional and difficult it is to get anything done. Um, how, how, do you, how do you keep this up? How, do you, how, how are you not completely uh, d dysfunctional, to be honest? Oh, well, okay, first, I, I live in Syria. I'm actually doing my residency in Syria. So being someone who's involved in the healthcare system, uh, I see what, what it lacks. I see the, the obstacles that it's, uh, the, the system is facing. So it's kind of uh, an incentive for me uh, to work, even though despite, despite all the obstacles that's happening. Uh, to be honest, it's... It's really frustrating sometimes, but sometimes it also gives you much incentive to do it, still. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mariana. Mariana, a question. Did you fly from Syria? Yes. Okay, I don't have a question. I just want to say very well done, and it's thank obvious you. how energetic you are. Thank you. So keep this energy, and I hope you find the right support very soon, yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. I don't need it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Such an honor. Such an honor. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, I'm Mariana. I'm in Newcastle University and I've got so many links, so please get in touch because I'll put you through I will with all you. the right people to coach you, mentor you, and, you know, have those links in terms of... Thank you, you know, very much. I'm going That's to Syria, actually, soon uh, to see my family, so do come and catch me up. I'd, I'd like to present and do something with thank yourself. Thank you very much. Thank, okay, you. That's, thank you. That's the purpose of us being here. Thank you. Uh, me too. I'm a health service research and development specialist, so I'm glad to, to be in contact with you and to make advice and research methodologies and statistical analysis. So you Thank are you. most welcome. Thank you for your support. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to thank you, and I want to talk about a very important point, which is the volunteerism. You, not only you are doing this in a country that is suffering, and you really, you know, this hope that you have, and Syria has been a country that was really advanced in our region in terms of education and medicine and law, and we wanted to see it back that way. But also, there is a lot of academic discussion about the NGOization of activism and of uh, collective efforts. And this has actually reflected negatively on it. You, you were talking, Plum Lebanon, uh, sorry, about this. <laughs> and I, you know what? We need you to get supported, but we don't want you to be corrupted by the NGOization of <laughs> mobilization. And I don't know how we can sol solve this problem because many of our work as feminists, as you know, you know, everybody who's doing an activism, suddenly we become, you know, dragged into reporting, financial mm -hmm. reporting, deadlines, and you know, the donors and what the donors want. And we want you to stay pure, but we really need to find a way to support them. So thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. We, ho we hopefully are staying so. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. 
Um, please help me welcome Heba Salem, who's a research associate at the University of Cambridge. The bell rings at 12.30 p.m., marking the beginning of the day for thousands of Syrian refugee students in Jordan. 30 minutes of coexistence between two communities have ended as Jordanian students from the morning shift head home. The second wave of students line up and they sing the Jordanian national anthem. A Quranic verse is read and then, in a unified voice, a short song praises the importance of education. The bell rings once more. Four hours of school are about to begin. This picture resembles an average day in over 200 schools in Jordan in an organized structure called the double shift system, which has now been extended over eight years. The double shift system uses one building and one curriculum, but it sees two distinct groups of students over two blocks of hours. Morning hours are for Jordanian citizens and the afternoon are for Syrians. The system is also not unique, now common in Lebanon. In 2017, I went to Jordan as part of my PhD research to meet Syrian students who had left Syria and who were now attending this double shift system. Three years earlier, I had left Syria myself to pursue an MPhil and a PhD in education. Underpinning my decision to leave was my own experience of unimaginable and irreversible loss that I had witnessed in my home. I was unwilling to sit idly as I saw Syria's children lose out on months and years of education. Education that shapes learning, well-being, as it can do for all of us. For the last five years, I have studied the effects of displacement and conflict on, on children's aspirations at Cambridge. I have worked on both academic and consultancy-based projects, examining the challenges that face children in these settings. And of all my time as a researcher, my most valuable experience was be meeting these Syrian students in Jordan, who have ultimately shaped my knowledge and they have nourished my drive today and my work and valuable change in challenging contexts. It was a cold February day in Jordan and I had been approved to research students' experiences in four schools in Amman. I was one of the first researchers ever to be granted access to actually do this inside. On my, on my way to school on the first day, I thought, what would my relationship be like with these students? Would they want to speak? And how would they see me? And so I entered the classrooms nervously. But I was greeted by smiling students as different groups asked me to sit next to them. It was a very good start. And I received the same warmth from all four schools, from 40 female students and 40 male students. Over the two months that I spent with them, the warmth they showed me did not wave, waver. Their eagerness was strong. And until the day I left in April, they continued to want to talk and share their experiences. I arrived a stranger to these students, but I left as a friend and a listener and a confidant. Today, I want to share the stories of these students and what these stories demonstrate about the importance of belonging inclusion and of advancing towards cohesiveness rather than separation, imbalance, and inequity. I want to share the powerful sense of urgency that these students showed, asking to be given opportunities to, bo to make bonds and to aspire and to see a life beyond their legal status. I hope these stories remind us that we need to sp speak to the youth of our region to help us understand where we need to go next. And before I share these stories, we have to recognize that the circumstances facing these nations are overwhelming. Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey have taken in over 1.7 million children from Syria alone. These countries have become the sole window of hope, of shelter and security for these children. And governments and organizations and individuals have worked relentlessly to provide shelter and education for children, repurposing national spaces and resources to create education opportunities in non-formal, formal and informal sectors. I was very interested in the formal system and the double shift system, which was taken to integration. The system was praised for being innovative because it integrated refugees into the formal system following the same curriculum. And the system also impacted the education of Jordanian students themselves because the hours were reduced. So the system of compromise was implemented to give refugee children opportunities to re-enroll in education after years of losing out. And it was able to achieve increasing enrollment rates for thousands of refugee children. But I really wanted to understand, years later, after being segregated, what were children's aspirations and experiences in these schools. I wanted to know the answer through students' own voices, because they have experienced displacement and separation firsthand. 
And I was aware that huge investments were made into these uh, settings in order to give students better prospects of their futures. But the aim of the system was actually tainted by huge dropout rates for Syrian refugee children, especially by the sec end of secondary education. And of course, poverty and hardships that follow displacement are undeniable and they play a huge factor. But if our investment in education is built on the premise that education can help children lead better lives and imagine better futures, what is happening? Back in Jordan, I listened to students as they described their dreams and aspirations and passions for life. The careers and specialties and dreams they held and thought of before they went to bed every night. Many of them had said that the first week of school at Jordan gave them a sense of childhood back after missing out on months and years of education. And in a writing exercise as part of my research, pages were filled with the hopes they had for their futures. To have a hobby, to meet friends, to learn a language, uh, and to be recognized for the positive contribution to the world. In fact, that was the main thing. Over and over, I heard students talk about their desires to be seen and recognized. I quote, I want to become a scholar in any kind of subject, so that if I die, people will always remember me and know my name. I want to be an active and productive person so that generations after mine remember me. I want to become a famous actor so that people recognize me in the streets and they like me. And as these stories unraveled, I realized that these aspirations were actually a response to their harsh realities. Students described having been in Jordan for four years but not meeting a single Jordanian student in a positive space. They talked about being, not being able to add their classroom drawings, just drawings from the classroom and putting them on the walls like their Jordanian students. They talked about not being able to see any of the Jordanian historical sites even though they learned about them in textbooks because of a ban on school trips for Syrian refugees. Students desired to, ex to think of Jordan as a home, having spent the majority of their youth in this country. And it dawned on me that children's desperation to contribute to society in meaningful ways was born out of feeling unseen. For many students, their educa educational spaces had repeated and re reinforced a sense of inequity and desperation. And the globally advertised value of education that we advertise was perceived as a wishful and naive notion by the students I met who were thinking of dropping out months to come. And it wasn't just poverty and hardships, though they were true. Many of, whom, many of the students I met worked before and after school, and many female students were thinking of marriage as a relief to their parents' anxiety and stress. But it wasn't the only thing that was convincing them that they should drop out. It was actually the isolation they experienced, separated from family and friends, and prevented from forming new and meaningful bonds. Some Syrian students had told me that they hadn't spoken to anyone in five years, only the classmates that they had known. Leila, for example, had told me that her desire to continue school was being muted by the loneliness and rejection she felt, and she was beginning to accept marriage as, as a prospect because she felt like her childhood was denied because she could not form any friendship or have normal conversations. It was the constant bullying and harassment they faced by Jordanian students, who too had not been given a chance to meet Syrians or make sense of the changes that had occurred in the country. Those moments were painful reminders, as described by Selma, who told me, I think a lot about what I went through in Syria, but I think about it most when someone in Jordan upsets me. It was the pain they felt as teachers expressed their lack of belief and faith in a future for Syrians, and the lack of dignity they experienced as they were asked to clean their schools due to a lack of cleaning staff in the afternoon shift. It was the lack of opportunities to imagine a future in Jordan, banned from the right to be employed, and unable to imagine a return to Syria. Students questioned the point of enduring their school spaces and pursuing degrees, when they were prevented from actually employment because of their career status, of, of their legal status. Ahmed said, teachers, neighbors, and my relatives, they say there's no point to my education. They say it will lead to nothing as a Syrian. This pain, frustration, and fear that was created by these experiences are alarming, and their effects are not yet known to us. Knowing nothing but rejection and accepting violence as a norm, Sami said to me, we are all afraid of, of the future. We are not liked. I don't know why they don't like me, they don't even know my name, they just know me by the word refugee. I watched every day as students battled between the right to education and the realities that prevented true inclusion and integration by segregated school spaces, employment policies, and attitudes towards refugees as unwanted and temporary others. But there were also small and simple opportunities for change, examples that had had incredible impact on students' feelings. A group of students told me about a small initiative in Jordan that brought together Syrians and Jordanians one hour a week, once a week. And they told me about how they worked and cooked and ate together and how these 
small examples actually shifted from the violent shift over between the 30 minutes before school for Syrians have turned into friendly hellos and how are yous and students were become, be, becoming friends just through that 30 minutes an hour. Students felt that they were able to feel more safe and able to belong and because of that some students were actually saying I'm no longer to, going to drop out this year and this is very promising. Students were also inspired and comforted by a small number of teachers who treated them with care, respect and dedication. Teachers who sought to better the conditions for their students through simple initiatives like forming a football team or activity days or by simply engaging with them in positive and friendly conversations. And students said that this empathy that shown by their teachers was life-changing for their well-being and their prospect of a continuing education. Students during my research also stated that the research itself and simply being able to engage in a project where they were allowed to think about their lives, reflect on their aspirations and values and express their feelings had alleviated some of the sadness they felt. When I first went to the schools, students couldn't identify a single hobby they had or what they liked to do or what they thought about. But they stated that through this project, they learned to identify, write and speak about that which makes them happy and sad and that now poetry and writing and talking is what they like to do. And it made them realize that their individuality, uniqueness, and presence is not invisible and it's not unimportant. And this is a very good starting point. The time and spent in Jordan illustrated the importance of schools and its potential to help refugee children gain their right to learning, but also the importance of pushing beyond ideas of access and enrollment. Displacement continues to be extended and the Arab region is being reshaped by movement and diversity. We have to think about the educational spaces as opportunities to help children learn about each other in safe spaces, for communities to accept one another, and for futures to allow youth to dream rather than despair. This is the reality that we as a region face. Our solutions to displacement can't continue to see generations as temporary guests, for we will continue to allow generations to be despaired in isolation, to reject and be rejected by, the, by other, and to create nations and cities where tensions between communities have been taught by the very structures that we ourselves have created. Not only do we need to invest more in education, but we need to invest in the right kind of education. We have to come with structures that support the well-being of all children, of all communities, and they nurture acceptance, belonging, and hope. We have to begin to reflect on the effects of segregated spaces, whether they are in schools, and camps, in employment, or in communities, when refugee crises are no longer temporary. And we need to listen to students to better understand their needs and our own shortfalls. We need to think about their well-being and futures, for our region depends on what we allow them to experience. We need to change the narrative about refugees. These reflections are shared by children who have experienced these realities firsthand. Their identity is now shaped by the worlds that we have allowed them to live in. I conclude these thoughts with news words, who said to me on my last day at school that if she could tell the world one thing, it would be, don't judge us for our appearances. Try to speak to us, not through your money, but through your feelings towards us. Talk to us that can help us feel better about our lives. So let's invest in dialogue, in hope, and in coexistence. Uh, thank you all for staying um, this far into the evening. I know um, we're at the very last 15-minute slot, so I appreciate your staying here um, and hearing out uh, what I have to share. Uh, hopefully, it'll be worth it. Um, I want to begin by saying that as a student of history, uh, you're always in conversation with words written by people who are no longer with us. Um, and what's beautiful about the human mind is that as these words traverse your cognitive capacities, they become alive. And they become alive as they're animated by the contemporary world, by the world you're navigating. And so I hope today to bring some of these conversations that I've been having uh, with people in history who are no longer with us so that they may bear upon this present moment in all of its complexity. Um, and the first conversation I want to share with you is a conversation I have with James Baldwin the African-American thinker, intellectual, novelist, 
an essayist, um, who lived for a period in exile, in chosen exile out of the United States, given the racist history of white supremacy in that country. And he lived for a while in Paris and then in Istanbul. Um, and his journey of exile mirrors the journeys of my grandparents from Aleppo under the first regime of Assad, from Al Hijaz, Medina Al Munawwara, from Nablus, and of course from Jerusalem uh, during the 1948 Nakba. And this history of exile resonates, I mean, some would say epigenetically, culturally, literarily, in who I am and what I'm attracted to and what I can cope with um, and the desire to speak truth to power in moments that may jeopardize who I am and where I am and the resources available to me. So James Baldwin writes, the paradox of education is this that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which they are being educated. And it's a paradox because in some sense, the education provided in a certain context may end up challenging that context. And hopefully throughout the next 10 or 12 minutes, I'll be able to share a little bit more about what that means today. Um, but I'll begin this very conversation with my own personal journey in education and how I reached a point where James Baldwin became my conversational friend. I was born in Amman um, and I was encouraged by the society I was a part of, by my family to pursue medicine, to pursue engineering, to find a stable long-term job, um, you know, as one would do in caring for a family member. But I had questions um, and medicine and engineering didn't necessarily promise answers. Um, and so I decided that I must pursue philosophy. That was the catch-all term for my desire to question. And there being no programs dedicated to philosophy and critical inquiry in Jordan at the time, I pursued a series of scholarships in the US and later in the UK um, at the other university, at Cambridge. And in that process, I flit from discipline to discipline, from sociology to philosophy to comparative literature to history, looking for an intellectual home. And what I realized was that even in the US, even in the UK, these two bastions of academic freedom and development, there are two structural problems, one being general and the other being particular to me as an Arab. The general problem is that in the United States, there is a recent restructuring of what academia is. And this has specifically affected the humanities and social sciences. There's an identity crisis in the humanities that has made it more difficult to let the value of independent and critical inquiry remain indeed independent and critical. The term neoliberal was, was expressed earlier and that's a great phrase for describing a series of legal, cultural and political changes in the US and internationally that have rendered the humanities no longer um, as free, um, that have necessarily led to a quantitative, virtual relationship to this complex web of intimacy, which we call learning. The other problem is a much more particular one to my own status as an Arab, and perhaps we may share that problem, um, all of us being of and or relating to the region, which is that the curriculum I was experiencing was often skewed in highly Eurocentric terms. Even the attempts to diversify the curriculum, and now the new phrase is to decolonize the curriculum, is often still within the purview of tokenization, of checking certain administrative markers that lead administrators and certain liberal professors to say, we have included you know, person X on the syllabus and therefore we now have a decolonized curriculum. But indeed, the very capacity to enfold all these tokenized identities wasn't being challenged at a fundamental level. The ways of knowing were still very much Eurocentric and very much indeed playing into the neoliberal structure that was largely reconfiguring American higher education. And so I took leave from Cambridge. I was distraught, I was disillusioned. The kind of creative pulse that led me to academia was completely gone. I was a cog in the machine. My supervisor spoke in terms of professionalization, in terms of capacity building, in terms that were largely corporatist, even though as a professor in the English department, um, at least ostensibly, he was interested in the freedom to think. And so I went to Amman, 
and I held a public seminar. And it was about the humanities in the Arab world. And that public seminar became the basis for a new organization called the Institute for Critical Thought, which I founded the following year in 2016. And the idea is to create a truly independent institute. That may be my phone. All right. The idea, the idea is to create a truly independent institute which does not cater at all to the ways in which neoliberalism has restructured academia. So on the one hand, we refused any kind of partnerships with governmental organizations, with academic organizations, with NGOs, with international development capacity buildings. We rejected on principle any kind of affiliation. So on the one hand, we tried to avoid the neoliberalization of academia through this route. On the other hand, being in Amman, we developed an organic indigenous curriculum that tries to tackle some of the most pressing political, social, and intellectual issues we face from the vantage of the Arab world, from the extremely rich history of sociology, of philosophy, of philology, of phonetics, of theology. And to have these not only be catered towards the rethinking of an indigenous local knowledge, but also as contributions to the humanities at large, to provide an alternative to the tokenization of Arab intellectuals in the US and in the West. And what we've done in the past five years is grow the institute into a full-time graduate style center for teaching and research. And in that time frame, we've attracted hundreds of alumni from all around the world and from every inhabited continent who come to Amman specifically to be at the Institute because they recognize the limitations of Western neoliberal academic structures, but also the lack of truly diverse, truly decolonial knowledge production in those contexts. And I'm very happy to see a few alumni of the Institute here with us today. What that has meant in the past five years is a principled stance in how we conceive of our own knowledge for the world. It was no longer a matter of trying to fit within or convince some kind of Western system or committee or what have you, which a few of my colleagues have already talked about in terms of the hollowing effects, whether it be on citizenship or on education or on how the very project may have begun as a truly free, creative, grassroots impulse, but very quickly we live in a world in which immediately you'll have US aid and certain governments and Scandinavian you know, sovereign wealth funds trying to invest, appropriate, partake, and ultimately direct what was hitherto a transparent, democratically-led initiative. And there's no shortage of examples in every possible sector you can imagine of a truly free idea being co-opted, despite the best of intentions of everybody involved, including the well-intentioned liberal committee of you know, the relevant US aid uh, fund. What this means for the future is a way of bringing together people who may not come together otherwise in order to think and reflect beyond the specific ways in which academia brings us together. And what the Institute has done to that end is not only attract students, so not only people in secondary and tertiary educational systems, but also people from every possible sector. And we can talk more in the break, but I, I challenge you to come up with a demographic category. And I'll talk about a person at the Institute who was a member of our team. We have had old people, young people, professors from Western institutions who are facing these problems in their everyday lives. We have had scholars from Oxford, from Cambridge. We have had refugees who have not completed high school sitting in the same classroom. In one course called Ethics in Exile, we had a member of the government, a minister of social development, sitting in a seminar space with a refugee who had not completed high school, a Syrian refugee. And there was this intimacy in the room in which the hierarchies otherwise propelled in often condescending fashions were completely absent. There's something unique, and many of you who have been in a humanities seminar will know, there's something unique, indeed magical or transcendental, about being in a seminar where a text is what speaks, and we try to listen to it together. And these indeed are the kinds of spaces we try to cultivate. Um, and they've led to forms of friendship, to partnerships, to forms of intimacy beyond the classroom. In the past five years, alumni have gone on to become professors at American, at Western, and Arab universities. 
We have created civil partnerships outside of the institute, but based on the ethos we cultivate within it. We have, have had, we have had members create social entrepreneurship programs that are extremely critical and reflective and often partaking of the logic we're thinking about in the classroom. And that spirit of collaboration has led to great insights generally. Um, I want to share a little bit more about some of the courses we've taught before trying to think about how this might bear upon our moment today, how this might bear upon the Rhodes Said Forum uh, that we're all in. So these are a few of the courses we've developed. This is Kafka Goes to Palestine. Um, and I wish in another context that we could speak more about how this kind of literary, political, and ethnographic understanding of Kafka might bear upon how we read modernism. We have that had courses on aesthetic theory and the rich traditions of modernism between the West and the East. We have had courses on Islam and critical theory, thinking about the problematic aspects of an entirely secular approach to the humanities and what Islam as a rich resource for a set of different tools might teach us about society, about modernity, about governance and morality. This is the course I mentioned on ethics and exile in which we brought people from very different political backgrounds to read together. And of course, uh, these are a few pictures that were taken by a, a resident photographer who's a financial service analyst, you know, by training, an uh, Iraqi refugee. Um, and he became our official uh, photographer the moment we realized that he was quite excellent at capturing these moments. Um, scholars, of course, come from all around the world and they continue to do so. Um, and I want to share a little bit more about our, our Arabic language program briefly. We created a parallel program in Arabic. So the English program was attracted for, or was set up to attract international cohorts. So English being the lingua franca was uh, the opportunity or the base for bringing people from South America, from Australia, from Africa, and so on to come together and talk. But then we created an Arabic language program in parallel with the English language program. And it brought together a... Um, a brilliant array of locals, of scholars, of bakers, of technicians, of coders, of professors to talk about literature, philology, and the program at large takes the history, the incredibly rich history of the Arabic Islamic sciences, uh, various forms of sociological inquiry to bear upon the present moment. And so the pedagogy in the classroom directly affects the production of new forms of knowledge, of methods, and so on. So these are a few courses that we recently completed, Al-Fahm fi al-Dhil, Fikr Nusus al-Hallaj wa Ibn Arabi. Um, the current course uh, is called Al-Uzli wa al-Alam, and it's, uh, it's an attempt to really, and perhaps this is thematically relevant to, to the winters we experience in England, it's a chance to listen to winter and to think about what it might mean to dwell in isolation and pain, rather than kind of superficially avoid them through forms of commodified pleasure. And so we take very difficult texts that deal with this historically, from the poetry of Majnun Layla to the story of Maryam in the Abrahamic faith, to think about how pain and isolation are productive sites for creating forms of knowledge and forms of being, uh, which are otherwise not available. So uh, this, is, this is our logo. Um, I wanted to put that up there as well in case anybody is interested. Uh, one quick comment to make is that often we think of critique as being distant, as being something here we talk about in a, in a privileged space of awareness. But in fact, we ought to reflect on the terms in which we use and we inhabit spaces. Uh, and that's relevant to our conversation here at the Saeed Rhodes Forum. Um, money often comes with huge issues. And a second conversation I want to briefly share with you is one I have with the German Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin, who wrote that every document of civilization is also a document of barbarism. And that sounds theoretical, that sounds very elaborate, but being in Oxford, it's not very hard to see where this takes place. As some of you may know, Cecile Rhodes was a British imperialist who made his money off of the pillaging and exploitation of parts of South Africa. And he has a contested legacy today. Um, indeed, in the University of Cape Town, there was an effort to take down his statue, which was successful, and the effort at Oxford to take down his statue was unsuccessful. Right? So what does that mean? 
This very hall, if we talk about documents of barbarism, there's a literal document called the Balfour Declaration, which was co-authored by Alfred Milner, after whom this hall is named. What do we do with the legacies that condition the money we receive, the titles we ascribe to? Indeed, at the University of the West Indies, there was a call to change the name of Milner Hall there to Freedom Hall, and they were successful. And I hear that there are petitions here at Oxford to change this hall's name as well. And it would be curious to follow how we might allow that strategy of claiming legacies, how that might reflect back on the work we do. And finally, that leaves Saeed. Right? The, the, the name, the family name Saeed may have many associations. And I'll leave it to you to do the research about how this philanthropist and businessman made his money. But there's another element, another reminder that I resonate when I hear the word Said. I'm reminded of the other one, of Edward Said, who taught us that knowledge is always embedded within power, that the way we produce knowledge, where we produce it, and to what end, is always part and parcel of a system in which there is violence, in which there is oppression. And Said indeed is the third conversant in my own historical imagination. And whenever I go to new places, whenever I experience spaces that purport to talk about change, that purport to talk about hope, I always try to think about the context I'm in. Who built these buildings? Who is excluded? What is my role in figuring out the complex web of power that gives me the privilege to stand here before you today? And so going forward, I want to leave you with a very simple thought. How is it that we collectively, as very accomplished people from all around the Arab world, how can we together create a legacy which truly upholds the concepts of hope, of change, and of freedom? What might that legacy look like? Will it be more partnerships between the Rhodes Trust and an Arab philanthropist? Will it be advancing the brain drain of Arabs in Western contexts, where often they struggle to make sense of who they are and how they fit within this larger web of collegiate activities, of intellectual production, and so on? Or do we want to start building our own indigenous institutions and capacities? And with that, I want to share that the Institute this year has launched a new campaign for an endowment in order to create a fellowship for master's students to study in Amman. Imagine students from all around the world vying to achieve a scholarship, not to study as Schwarzman scholars study in China, or as Rhodes scholars study at Oxford, or as Fulbrighters study in the US, but to study in Amman, vying from Australia and New Zealand, from Cambodia to Mauritania, to come to the Arab world and be part of a way of creating knowledge that is indeed indigenous, that is indeed critical. And so I leave you with this idea that perhaps we can come together to create institutions that bring people from around the world to celebrate what we have to offer and indeed to celebrate it for ourselves. Thank you so much for listening.